Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see everyone here. Uh, I'm Vijay Kumar, the Dean of the Engineering School. Um, and it gives me just great pleasure to welcome you all for Penn's 20th Heilmeyer Lecture. Um, the George H. Heilmeyer Faculty Award for Excellence in Research was established in 2001. And the goal of this award is to recognize excellence in scholarly activities of our faculty. It's named in honor of our alumnus, uh, George Heilmeyer, class of 1958, electrical engineering. He accomplished numerous things, um, but in particular, he's known for the discovery of liquid crystals, which led to, of course, the first use of liquid crystals in watches, in calculators, and in instrumentation. And for this, he won the 1991 Medal of Science, the 1997 IEEE Medal of Honor, and then many other awards. Um, he also served as the director of uh, DARPA. And if you've heard about the Heilmeyer Catechism, which is a great uh, set of questions to ask yourself if you're submitting a proposal, submitting a paper, submitting a term project, if you're an undergraduate student in, this, in the audience. Uh, it's just uh, a lot of, you know, these this catechism is something that holds all of us in good stead. Um, um, so every year, the Heilmeyer Award winner gives the Heilmeyer Lecture. And, um, and every time I enjoy reading out the list of all the Heilmeyer Award winners, because it truly reads like a who's who in engineering. So going back to 2001, Raymond Gordy, Dennis Disher, Dan Hammer, Michael Kearns, Don Bonnell, Pedro Ponte Castaneda, Nader Engeda, Scott Diamond, Rajiv Alor, <coughs> Karen Whiney, John Vos, George Pappas, Xu Yang, Dan Kodachek, Vivek Shinoy, and Dan Roth. And of course, this year's award winner is our colleague from Material Science and Engineering, Ritesh Agarwal. And the award and today's lecture are very timely for two reasons. Uh, first, as you all know, the, today's Nobel Prize in Physics in 2022 recognized the very first experiments uh, with entangled photons. Um, and that, I think, established the basis of quantum information science and engineering, which is very closely related to today's lecture on quantum geometry and topology. Uh, second, and I'm not sure how many of you know this, but Today is the ninth anniversary of the inauguration of the Singh Center for Nanotechnology. Again, a facility that's very, very closely linked to the subject of today's uh, lecture. Um, however, I will not introduce uh, Ritesh. The honor of introducing uh, today's Halmar Award winner goes to Sh Professor Shu Yang, uh, who is the Joseph Bordonia Professor of Engineering and Applied Science and the chair of the Department of Material Science and Engineering, and I might add herself a Heilmeyer Award winner. So please join me in welcoming Xu Yang to the podium. All right. It's my great honor to introduce my colleague, um, Professor Ritesh Agarwal. And uh, as Vijay was saying, uh, today is the announcement of the Nobel Prize in Physics uh, in quantum information, quantum mechanics, right? So have many applications in, will uh, impact our life. So when I first saw this, I thought, oh, maybe Vijay has some back channel knowing the Nobel Prize organization, so that's why he chose today, and also knows potentially this topic will be selected. And uh, so this is very fittingly <coughs> and giving today's uh, um, topic by Ritesh. So let me introduce Ritesh. Uh, so Ritesh is actually came to Penn one year after I came to Penn. Uh, so very connected. And uh, Ritesh, he got his uh, um, bachelor degree and was integrated master degree from uh, Indian, uh, where is it? Uh, from, oh, hold on a second, all right. So from Indian Institute of Technology, Kanpur, and then he got his uh, um, uh, master degree from University of Chicago and went to the UC Berkeley for his PhD and then did another postdoc in Harvard. 
So his research has covered different directions and uh, is interested in investigating structural, optical, and electronic properties of low dimensional materials. And uh, um, he also developed different kinds of new probes to study complex phases of matter. And most recently, as you see the topic, his research is going towards the, uh, the um, so here is the geometry, quantum geometry and topology, all right, enabling different kinds of uh, chiral photonics. And uh, so Ritesh not only uh, interested in different kinds of materials from material synthesis to fabrication and also looking at the devices integration uh, as well as characterization. Um, so he has received uh, the NSF Career Award uh, the NIH director of uh, New Innovator, which is very, uh, um, it's a, a highly selective uh, award, very prestigious. Uh, Come and think about uh, material scientists going to NIH getting this New Innovator Award. And he's also the SPIE Nano Engineering um, Pioneer Award. And uh, uh, most recently, he's elected as a fellow of the Optical Society of America. All right. With that, oh, Ritesh, it's your score. Thank you. So th thanks, Shu. Uh, thanks, Vijay, for your very kind introduction. Uh, you know, uh, talk about pressure when you talk about Nobel Prize and my lecture on the same day. You know, <laughs> and that's a bit unfair, but you know, uh, thank you. Uh, so, so first, I'm incredibly honored and. You know, and feel myself very privileged to be giving the 20th Hellmeyer Award. Uh, and, uh, as you know, this award, you know, I'm just the spokesman for the group. Uh, it, this basically is a showcase of you know, almost 17 years of great, incredible work done by my students. I don't know, I was counting this Thursday. Four, uh, my 14th student will graduate on Thursday. So you, know, you can see how much, you know, how much effort goes into building what we do you know, over, you know, over a course of time. Uh, these wonderful collaborators, many of them are in this room today. Uh, funding agencies, you know, of course, you know, none of these things are possible without the support of your immediate colleagues, and your family, your friends. So all these people just put together and push you on the front where you go and give a lecture, which is where I am today. So thank you very much. But most importantly, thank you all for coming here in person, uh, you know, to attend this lecture, which, which itself is, is incredible because, you know, we should not forget we are still in the middle of this pandemic. And the reason why we are here without wearing masks, not many of you are wearing masks, is because you know, of these incredible advances that were made at Penn. So we really need to congratulate ourselves as a community of researchers you know, for the kind of things that we do. And although the most immediate application is the most obvious one, these vaccines, but if you, you, know, if, if you think about this, you know, none of these, you know, there, there is no area of science and engineering that can thrive as an island, you know, the huge amounts of progress have to be made in different areas <clears throat> for, you know, for, for progress to be made. And we see the final product, like for example, the delivery systems of polymer nanoparticles, the computation effort that goes into it requires incredible computation speed. You need networks, you need networks of computers. So there's a whole infrastructure of science and engineering. And this, you know, years, centuries of work, I would say that go behind, <clears throat> behind any major uh, progress that, that has made. So uh, in line with that, you know, I'm going to talk about some more futuristic things. You know, this, this is where I stand because you know, the work that I do is, may or may not be most immediately applicable. But the kind of thing that we are trying to do is thinking beyond what is happening today. And that is, can we make new materials, new uh, engineering principles, design paradigms to enable what, you know, what we call an on-chip chiral integrated photonics infrastructure? And I'll explain. Uh, for example, uh, you know, we all have computing devices, computers and all. Uh, the way they work is, you know, transistors turn on and off, and the entire circuitry or logic basically works behind counting the number of electrons that flow in the circuit. It's just a number counting, how much current flows. And when you turn the current on and off, you change the state of the system, so you read off that uh, current, you know, and that basically tells you if the transistor is on and off, you build logical devices, logic devices, and you go from there. So people asked this question many years back, can you encode more information in electronic devices? Okay. So uh, the answer is yes, by utilizing more degrees of freedom of your carrier, which is the electron, so you can use spin. Okay, so electrons have two fundamental spins, plus one and minus half, plus and minus half. So one can encode more information in spin. 
Okay, and this is the you know this is basically what is driving the field of spintronics. So, in an uh, in, in, uh, analogy, optical device, optical systems, photonic networks. Basically, the current photonic networks basically work by measuring the amount of light that flows in the circuit. Okay, so you have these you know, lasers which produce light. You have waveguides that transport light, and then you have detectors, and you have modulators which turn it into on and off signals, so zeros and ones, and then you have detectors that detect that light and produce current. That's how it works. Okay? So can we encode more information in these networks using other degrees of freedom of light, of photon? Okay? And the answer is, in principle, yes. So there are many other degrees of freedom, uh, two of which I'll talk about. Uh, one is the photon spin, just like electrons have spin, photons also have spin, plus and minus half. And in addition, there is this extrinsic degree of freedom, which we call the orbital or angular momentum modes, which I'll talk about. So now the challenge is, how do you make you know, these emitters, waveguides, detectors, which are sensitive to these degrees of freedom. So people have done it, sort of, uh, uh, using these bulky lasers. You know, you, you need a room full of lasers to be able to do this. But you can't do this on, an, on, an, on a chip. If you want an integrated photonics platform, which is where we have to go, then you have to really miniaturize this and put it on a microchip. And that becomes a very difficult problem. It's an incredibly difficult problem because most materials don't care about any of these degrees of freedom. That's it. You know, if you put silicon, it just counts the number of photons, right? If your silicon detectors just do that. So how do we do this? So this is, you know, so the, for example, uh, you know, just looking at this part, the photo detection part on chip, which is sensitive to these degrees of freedom. <clears throat> so these are the conventional photo, photo detectors that you can buy. So what a photo detector does, it just, you know, it works on quantum principles. It's a photon counter. It works on photoelectric effect. You shine light, it counts the number of photons, converts it to current, and gives you an output. That's what it does. But what it doesn't care is, is your light very focused? What is the spin degree of freedom? What is the mode? What is the phase? Because when you measure intensity, as you know, the phase information is gone. So how do we extract that information while measuring things on a chip? And that's an incredibly difficult problem. And as I said, you know, uh, uh, photons have uh, a pol uh, uh, spin, uh, spin plus and minus one, which basically manifests as polarization. So polarization is the direction in which the electric field of light oscillates. So the most obvious ones that we know of are, are you know, linear polarization. You have vertical and horizontal polarization. But you know, a more fundamental polarization are what is called circular polarization, in which the polarization basically rotates as light propagates. Okay? So you can have both left and right circulating polarization, and you can make linear combinations of these to produce other combination, or other polarization, like linear. Okay, so you, you have a phase relationship between left and right for a polarized photon, and then, and then you can create all other polarizations. So that, you know, these two right and left circular polarization corresponds to photon uh, spin. Okay, so that's one degree of freedom, which is intrinsic. The other is, nothing to do with polarization as such, is as light propagates, if the, if the optical wavefront of light undergoes a screw motion, like for example, what you see here, this, has, this is not polarization, it's different, but it's the actual wavefront of light which goes around in, uh, as a screw, okay? And then th there is a quantum degree of freedom here, how many times this optical wavefront winds a per unit distance or per unit time, which is given by wavelength or the frequency of light that, that is used. So if it winds once, then this quantum number is one, twice it's two, and if it can do the opposite direction, then it becomes minus or plus one. So if I write the, in and these, these are basically these are what are called the orbital angular momentum modes of light, so if I write the total field of electric field corresponding to this complex light which carries both polarization and orbital angular momentum, this is how the electric field looks like. You know, good luck measuring this on a chip and figuring out what is happening. What you will get here is just the intensity if, if you use a regular photo detector. So how do I extract that information? And the answer is conventional materials, conventional ideas will not work. Uh, yeah. So we have to do something, and this is the idea behind the talk. Okay? So this whole thing started uh, you know, as a project that you know, uh, Zurun and Gray uh, started doing. Uh, and that is uh, you know, shining light on these very complex materials, which, you know, which I'll describe. You know, uh, and and, and, uh, and then to, just to basically explore uh, what happens. And these are collaborators in Char uh, Charlie and Jean and Andrew. Uh, so some of them are here. Uh, <clears throat> all right, so now, so in my talk, because I'm, I'm going to introduce a few complex topics, at least complex for me, it may be easy for you. Uh, so I'm going to make an attempt. 
Okay, if it succeeds, great. If it doesn't, you know, I already have the award, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, okay, so again, just a bit of a, a history. So this is George Gamow, a very famous physicist, who wrote this incredibly influential book called Biography of Physics. This is not biography of a human being. It's a biography of a field, right? I mean, you can imagine what influence these people have. And he, and he said uh, in 1960s, 1961, that almost all areas of mathematics are useful, are, are being used in physics, except currently at that time, number theory and topology. Okay? And he says, maybe it will be used to understand the riddles of nature. This is 1960, and in 20 years, this thing changed completely. Okay? And one of the biggest you know, progress that was made, at that time, I'm, I'm not sure if they really realized it was they were dealing with topology, the way we understand it now, is a model that came from Penn Physics, which is called the SSH model, a schrieffer hegel model. And again, this was related to some incredible work uh, that led to Nobel Prize in Chemistry at Penn. This is Alan McDermott. Uh, uh, Heger also got shared the prize with him. Uh, Bob Schrieffer didn't get the prize for this, but he got the prize for his previous work on, uh, on BCS theory of uh, superconductivity. So the problem here that they were trying to understand was what Alan McDermott had measured, was you take this organic molecule, this polymeric molecule, polyacetylene, and you dope it with something. The conductivity changes by 10 or 15 orders of magnitude, not 10 or 15 times. So they could not explain, because you know polymers are messy, gooey substances. You know, they don't have any order. So why is it that they conduct so much? Okay? So they, they started to think, and they, uh, and they created this model, which is called the Sushi from uh, SSH model. So what you ha have here is, so th let's say this is the unit, uh, unit cell, and this you can repeat, uh, so you create periodic structures. So there is this uh, strength of coupling between within a unit, V, and then between two units, which is W. And what they realized was if V equals to W, then you have a band structure where you basically uh, don't have a gap. It's, it's you know, there's no gap here, so it's a metal. But if V and W are staggered, if V is more than W or the other way around, then you get these two band structures. If you look at these band structures, they look the same. So what is going on? What they realized was by analyzing there's something, you know, related to how the, how the, this vector winds. Yes, so this, this basically what they realize are very different Hamiltonians. They look the same, they both are insulators, but they carry very different properties. And if you, if you create interfaces between these structures, then you can basically have a soliton mode which cannot, which, which will just propagate without much dissipation. Okay, so this basically formed the idea of topology, uh, and, uh, and they call it solitons. And now anyone who joins my group, for example, and maybe in other groups, now, they have to really understand this model to be able to make any progress you know, and, and go forward. Okay? But the, the experiment that really changed everything, in my opinion, uh, probably is true, it's not just my opinion, it's, uh, it's, it's this, uh, what is called the quantum hall effect, done in, uh, reported in 1980, 81, where the experiment is the following. So they basically took, so can, any, uh, okay, since, uh, can anyone guess what was the material system that was used for this quantum hall effect discovery? Does anyone know? Exactly, it's the silicon, the transistors that we use today. Because at the oxide or silicon interface, you create a two-dimensional electron gas. And you can clean the system up so it can become a very nice system. So what they did was, this, uh, they, they created, the, they, they basically, fab, uh, they got the samples from, I'm forgetting from whom, uh, 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 and they basically passed some current and applied a very strong magnetic field in a very clean sample. And they measured resistance of conductivity in the, uh, in the transverse direction, okay? And what they found was incredible. So if you, if you look at the conductivity, you see these conductivity plateaus. Okay, so it basically suddenly jumps as a function of magnetic field. And these, these plateaus are highly uh, quantized. And if you change the state of the system, if you put some minor amount of impurities, you, you do some change in the system, these plateaus would not change. And this, again, upended physics once and forever. Because you know, when we think of resistance, how dirty is the sample? What is the scattering of the carriers? All these all these parameters become important. But here, it, the system didn't quite care. So this basically got people in, you know, thinking very hard that there must be something else that is happening that we've not really captured. Okay? And this led to the idea of topology because topology is a branch of geometry which, which basically talks about stability of the structures under some adiabatic transformation. It doesn't, you know, once you have a particular topology, you have to, have, you have to do something dramatic to change it, which is what I'll talk about. So what happens is when you have these conductance plateaus, then the transport basically occurs not through the bulk of the sample, but through the edge of the samples, okay? And 
And this conductance, is, these are one-dimensional channels, so this, the resistance is, or conductance is quantized. Yes, yeah, so you have a quantum of resistance, a quantum of current, whichever you want to describe it, uh, that happens here, okay? So although the conduction happens at the edges, it's the property of the bulk which determines these properties. Okay? So it's the bulk edge correspondence, a, a, another very important aspect of how people you know, relate topology to physics. Okay? And then there are these uh, some invariants that basically classify them, you know, what topological you know, state the matter is in. Okay? So again, I know people from different backgrounds and you know, a few years even I didn't understand this, so just, just to go over everything in some sort of a pedagogical manner. So when we think of you know, electrons in solids, solids are basically you know, structures in which, or matter, or materials in which atoms are placed at some periodic distance. Okay, so that's how you create a solid. So, so the way to, you know, so Bloch wrote a theorem uh, in which he said the total wave function or the way to think about electronic wave functions, electrons are waves in quantum mechanics, is at each site, each atomic site where the atom sits, you put a very local function, okay, u, uh, which, which, you know, which, which could be orbitals, for example, and then you basically uh, create hopping between, or you enable hopping of electrons from one to the other, Okay, some, some sort of weak hopping that happens. And then as you go from one side to the other, this is the, this, this is the overall phase of this electronic wave function. So you have these very localized orbitals of functions, and then you have this phase. Okay, so this is how the total wave function looks like. And of course, it's a theorem, so you proved it uh, rigorously. You, you put this in your uh, Schrodinger's equation, you solve, and you get these electronic bands. Yeah, and this was a major discovery, again, in physics and chemistry. And chemists, chemists call it linear combination of atomic orbitals, LCAO, and you know, uh, Hoffman got the Nobel Prize for this many years back at Cornell. Okay, so so this was you know this this explained a lot of things in physics, but then people started to think again you know when you have something in your hand you play with it and you start discovering new things. So Berry in 1980s basically realized, and this is you know this is a thought experiment. So let's say you have you take a wave function, it's associated with a vector, okay, and you basically on a, on a sphere for example, not not that it has to be. You take it along a path, and you bring it back. So it cannot be a flat surface, it's, it's a curved surface. So if you take along this path, you see what happens to the vector. When it comes back, it doesn't come back to its original state. Although everything is the same, there's a phase. And that's what is called Berry's phase. This, had, this was actually discovered for classical optics by, uh, by Panchratnam, Shivashankar Panchratnam in India, in, I think in 1930s. He was a C.V. Raman student. And uh, he had discovered this, but of course, you know, being an Indian, everything is forgotten. Forgotten. So you know, Berry rediscovered it, and then Berry was told that this was done before, and you know, and he acknowledged. So that's why it's called Panchratnam Berry phase. So important thing is, there's something more. There's a geometrical aspect because depending on the path that you take, the phase is different. Okay? So it's a purely geometrical thing, uh, and, and you know, so so again, just to jump, you know, from from where, where I am. So the Berry. So there's something which is called the Berry, Berry connection or Berry potential. As you can see, it's a very interesting uh, you know, formula. This is the wave function, and this is the gradient of the wave function. You see, overlap the wave function with its own gradient and kind of map what is going on. So it has, you, know, you can start to see there's some geometry emerging here. And, and, and from here, you can define the Berry phase. And there's something, another, another very important thing that is described here is what is called the Berry curvature, which is just the gradient of this Berry connection. And those of you who are you know, comfortable with electrodynamics will probably see this connection. You know, if it, you know, this, this basically generates what is called a magnetic field, but in the momentum space. Okay? So this, you know, this acts as not a real magnetic field, but a magnetic field, in, a pseudo magnetic field in momentum space. But interestingly, this very curvature that you get can relate to a, a particular type of a, a topological constant, which is called the churn number. Okay? So you do this integral of this, uh, of this Berry curvature. Uh, over the over the brillouin zone, and and you you get a number an integer. If it is zero, then that means the system is topologically trivial. And if you get an integer, then it is you know depending on the integer, it's in that topologically non-trivial state. Okay. So again, the topology or the idea of the topology is like for example, if you have a sphere and if you have a donut, you count the number of holes, and from the uh, 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 <clears throat> the gauss bonnet uh, theorem, you can basically calculate the average curvature. So you get integer, uh, integers as uh, average curvature, so you get zero here and one here. So basically the idea, is, uh, idea of topology is, if you take, let's say, a sphere, 
You can roll it into a plate, you can do anything, as long as you don't connect things or punch holes. It will always have the same genus, equal to zero. Same thing with, with, with this donut, it can be molded into a cup because the number of holes remains the same, okay? As long as you don't punch new holes. So same thing here for electronic system, you have a Hamiltonian, you can adiabatically evolve your Hamiltonian, but don't do anything, don't close the gap, it's an insulator, so don't close the gap, and don't do anything too dramatic, okay, equivalent to this, then the system remains in that topological state. So that basically gives you its robustness, okay? So, and again, so from here, you know, there's something called the Wilson loops, but just a very quick idea of what, what you know, what, what it entails. So we can calculate along certain directions, certain paths, from the very phase, these Wilson loops. So let's say if a loop is called a trivial loop, uh, uh, this, the states exist on this, uh, on this torus. So this can be adiabatically transformed to a point. But any other loop, like for example, a loop which goes around like this, I cannot, trans I cannot transform it into a point uh, otherwise without cutting through this uh, hole, okay? So th this, this is another way of classifying topology of matter. Okay, so these are different ways of classifying topology of matter and uh, and then one, one last slide or, or, or along this uh, construction is, you know, since my talk contains ideas of geometry and topology. So, so I talked about the Berry curvature. So uh, there's something called the uh, geometric, quantum geometric tensor. The real part of the quantum geometric tensor is basically a metric, just like you have a yardstick to measure distances. So it me measures the quantum distance between two states. And the Berry curvature that I mentioned basically measures the phase difference between the two quantum states. So by this, you can map out your entire structure. You basically know how far your quantum states are. And if you want to go from one to the other, you can basically design experiments or systems to go. Like, for example, if I fly from here to Bombay, we know we don't fly straight because, you know, the world is not flat, right? So by understanding the geometry of this Earth, you know, we have optimized where we are all the way to, you know, we go all the way to the pole and then come down because that's some optimized distance. So this, when you understand the geometry of your entire Hamiltonian of your system, then it enables you to, you know, understand the system and manipulate it much more. All right, so Charlie Kane is here, one of the biggest discoveries from Penn. So one is the quantum Hall effect. So what is this topological insulator of quantum spin Hall effect that these uh, uh, Kane and Miller discovered? So what they discovered, again, you know, you know he's here, so it's, it's an amazing experience for me. Uh, in the quantum Hall effect, you have to apply a magnetic field to create these new topology, uh, to topologies. What they realized is in certain materials in which the spin-orbit coupling can be very strong, in those cases, what happens is you, can, you don't need to apply a magnetic field, and you can get what are called two copies of the quantum Hall effect, so that the time reversal symmetry is, 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 you know, is preserved. In a quantum Hall effect, when you apply a magnetic field, uh, the time reversal symmetry is broken, but here, you, know, you don't apply a magnetic field, so it's preserved. So from a quantum chemistry perspective, the way I understand in a simple manner is, you know, in, when we look at bands of electronic materials, there's a particular ordering of bands, okay? Like for example, you have you know, you know, bands which correspond to particular orbitals, so you end up in a valence band, and then you have a conduction band, and, and there's a particular ordering. But if you increase these, for example, spin-orbit coupling, which typically occurs in materials which are, you know, with, with, you know, where the atoms are very large, very heavy. In those cases, the spin-orbit coupling can actually exceed, the values can exceed the band gap of the material. Again, these are rough energy scales. And in that case, the conduction band can actually go below the valence band, okay? So that's called band inversion, okay? So, so that, you know, that, that when, you know, when that happens, for example, they recognized uh, through very complicated math, there's a new topological invariant that comes, which is called the Z2 invariant, and they solved the math for that, which is incredible, okay? So now you have, if, if this band inversion takes place because of the spin-orbit coupling, then you have a material which is in a, in a, in a Z2 equal to one topologically non-trivial state, now, when you have this material, and you know, every material ends up on a surface, okay? Let's say you have vacuum. Vacuum is a trivial insulator where you know, this, this invariant is zero. So as I said, when you can only go from one type of insulator to the other if they're topologically different, only by closing the band gap. So you close the band gap on the surface, so that is why you create these surface states which are metallic on the surface. So you hear you know, topological insulators, they, they conduct only on the surface but not in the bulk. That's the reason why they conduct only on the bulk, because the band gap closes and it becomes, forms these semi-metallic states on the surface, so it conducts. But another in interesting thing here is, they conduct in very interesting ways. So these dispersions, they are basically, they have what is called spin, uh, spin momentum locking. So when, when, when you have transport on the edge of the sample, the spin up 
electrons go in one direction and spin down electrons go in another direction. So you have two topological channels which are scatter free. You cannot scatter from one to the other without changing the, the spin state of, uh, the, uh, the spin degree of freedom of the electron, which can happen if by magnetic impurities or magnetic field. Okay? Without that, they will be dissipationless, in principle dissipationless transport, and that's the beauty of this field. Okay? Another topological class of materials, and now focusing on to the work that I'm going to talk about, are what are called wild semi-metals, okay? where you have these uh, very interesting band crossings. You know, this is like some, the crossing that happens on the surface. Something similar can happen in these materials in the bulk. And that helps us as material scientists because you know, surface is very hard to control. When something happens in the bulk, you have more degrees. You know, you, you know if you have a clean sample or cleaner sample, uh, you, know, you know where your states are, you know where your Fermi level is. Surface is just you know, surface. Okay? So you start with you know, something, if you recognize it's good, uh, it's something which is, which is this uh, linear dispersion called the Dirac cone, and you break either time or spatial inversion symmetry. This splits into two cones, and these are called the wild cones. And the electrons that exist in these wild cones are called wild fermions, and there's a certain chiral relationship uh, that develops between these two, uh, you know, these two wild cones. And I mentioned Berry curvature, so one of these cones acts as a source of Berry flux, you know, it's a magnetic field, pseudo-magnetic field in momentum space, not the real one. So one becomes a source, the other becomes a sink. These two basically get, get connected by these Fermi arc states on the surface, but nevertheless, there is this uh, crossing in the bulk, okay? So now, so I've introduced this complex state of light and this complex state of matter. You know, when you're clueless, you just combine these two very difficult problems, you know, and then figure out what happens. So what I'm going to talk about next is basically our efforts you know, this you know, just you know, this is plain, plain torture. You know, but, you know, for five years. So, so, how we basically tear it apart and then we put it together in interesting form and then start making detectors that I talk about. Okay. So the experiment that I'm going to talk about are called what are called a, a, a photogalvanic effect. Okay. So I'll describe this, of course. Uh, so just uh, in electrochemistry, you have this galvanic effect. You know, our batteries basically work this way. You, you take two chemical reactions, you complete the circuit, you, know, you can get work out from the system okay, without putting in work. You know, same thing happens with light, like photovoltaic cells, solar cells. In a solar cell, you shine light, but you need to have an interface that breaks the symmetry. And because of which, what happens is uh, electrons and holes go in different directions. And then you basically collect them, you create a voltage difference, and you can, you know, you can connect this to your bulb resistor and drive work, okay? So now the question is, um, you know, can you get the same photovoltaic effect without having an interface, without having a PN junction? So it's you know, what people like Andrew Rapp call the bulk photo, photovoltaic or bulk photogalvanic effect. Of course, there's no magic. You have to basically obey some symmetries or break some symmetries, okay? Here, the symmetry is broken by actually making, engineering a physical junction, here you can have a bulk material. So, and this is very, this is very interesting because now you know, photovoltaics have efficiency limited by, you know, by, by, by what is called the quasi, uh, 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 the limit, the Shockley limit. Uh, here, in principle, you don't have that limit, but you know, we are using this mostly to interrogate our materials. Okay. So, a particular type of photogalvanic photo effect is what is called the circle of photogalvanic effect. So, now it will start making sense why I spend so much time talking about basic things. So the idea is, if you shine right circularly polarized light, just like a screw, current goes in one direction, and if you change the chirality of light, now it becomes left circularly polarized, opposite of that, and if the current flows in the opposite direction, then you have this circular photogalvanic effect, okay? Again, it does not, if I give you any, any common material, it won't happen. It's, it's, it's a very, it's a, it's a unique phenomenon, it's not a general phenomenon, okay? So you can see based on the helicity of this, you know, this, this bolt basically it moves either in this direction or that direction. Same thing here. Can light drive the same motion of carriers just by changing the, changing the helicity of light? Can the current flow in opposite directions without applying any external voltage? Okay, that's the idea. So again, this is controlled by complex tensors, and this is where the property symmetry properties of uh, matter is included. So this phenomena that I'm describing is a nonlinear optical phenomena. So again. You know, we like to do perturbation theories because of the lack of anything, any you know, full theory. So the polarized, when you shine light on a material, you polarize the material. So you break this perturbatively as different orders of the electric field. So this is the linear effect, electric field to the power one, and all the absorption, scattering, emission, photoluminescence is governed by this. This is the phenomena that I'm talking about. You can see there are two interactions with the electric field, okay? 
This is the tensor of chi2 or susceptibility which controls this phenomena. Okay? So now the two interactions are interesting because one interaction happens at omega. The other interaction, if it happens at minus omega, then the output is a static field. That static electric field produces current. You apply electric field and you produce current. But without actually applying a battery, of connecting to a battery, this is what light does. Okay? So again, as I said, certain symmetry requirements allow this phenomenon to be non-zero. So within what is called, and again, I'll explain it you know, a couple of slides down the line. Within what is called the electric dipole approximation, there are only 18 point groups that enable this. So this is a necessary condition, by no means a sufficient condition. So this is a symmetry, symmetry constraint. Okay. So I'm going to skip this. So our, our entry into this phenomena, again, you know, this, this was discovered in Russia, then you know, the Western world didn't, uh, didn't acknowledge, then recently it has become popular here. And my group's entry into this uh, started in 2015. So this was a wonderful collaboration we had with uh, Gene, where my postdoc, Sajal, who's, you know, who's, who's a faculty member in IIT Kharagpur now in physics, he, he took silicon, okay? Why? There's no reason. Silicon has all the mirror symmetries. It has inversion symmetry. There is no way this circular photodynamic effect should work. But he took a nanostructure, a nanowire, which terminated in a very unique, very interesting surface, which has these zigzag chains. So because of this surface states, and these are not dirt states, these are real surface states of silicon, and there's a geometrical effect, the direction in which the wire is growing, where, where the surface states are, of these chains are, and the presence of some electric field, a short key field, uh, he, you know, he was able to break all the mirror symmetries of silicon in a systematic manner. And he made a non-chiral material chiral that, that was sensitive to circular polarization of light. So this is step one in making, you know, making detectors out of silicon, a common material, which are sensitive to photon spin. You know, the, one of the first detectors, it's definitely out of silicon, which was sensitive to photon spin. And then you know, this, was, this problem was at the back of my mind, and then we basically, you know, you know in the back burner, and then, then we re revived this project uh, when, when these new materials, which, are, which, which I described, wild semi-metals were discovered. It's a new phenomenon. These were, these were I think, theorized by Ashwin in, I don't know, 2011, 2012 or 20, like not, not less than eight, eight years back. And then very quickly, people made these samples, these materials, these MOT2 or MOWT2, these are layered materials. And at, you can even, by doping this, or WT2, you can get this quantum wild semi-metal phase even at room temperature. That's the most amazing thing. So you can have a quantum phase of matter at room temperature. You don't have to go down to millikelvin or a few kelvin de uh, degrees. So it's an inversion broken. Uh, it's a TD symmetry group, again, you know, just for details. Uh, it's a wild semi metal. So we basically, you know, being clueless we were, we, you know, we, we took our light source and we did this experiment. Uh, it's an easy experiment, but easy only if you know what you're doing. Uh, you know, we only knew how to do the experiment, but other, after that we, did, we knew nothing. Okay. So what we realized was the following. Although the material has no inversion symmetry, it has mirror planes uh, in, in the x and y direction. So if you come at normal incidence, so this is the sample, if you come at normal incidence, because of symmetry, this phenomena, this circular photodynamic effect should not have been there. Okay. So that surprised us. Okay. Another very interesting thing was, what we found was the response, the circular photodynamic current was a very strong function of where we were shining on the sample. Okay. So if we shine in the, at the line joining the two electrodes, which collects the current, there's no, there no current, there's no circular current. And if you move away, then the current basically increases. And depending on which direction we go, the current either becomes plus or minus. Another important thing is, depending on how focused the light is, the response changed. So if the light was very focused, it was very strong, produced a very strong circular response, or the current response, and under the limit of homogeneous excitation, the response went to zero. And this is very interesting, especially for a spectroscopist, because what I'm describing you here is what is called the non-local response, and I'll discuss this. Again, college-level physics. I mean, this is something which we were forced in my college when I was in my first year, didn't understand anything. You know, now, I'm, you know, you know, of course, you have to learn it properly. So if you have a, if you have a, you know, a material, a, you know, any material, and in, in, in the continuum model, you have a charge distribution, Okay, so how do you account, how do you, how do you study this? So again, you know, just like perturbative theories, you calculate the moments, okay? You, so you know, the, the zero, the other mode, uh, 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 <coughs> moment gives you the charge. So this is zero, there's no net charge. Uh, in this material, uh, in the, in the, because of the symmetries, the next, the first order moment, it gives you the dipole. This is also zero by symmetry. 
So the next is the electric quadrupole. So what we are seeing here is the electric quadrupole response. And why do I know this is electric quadrupole response? Because in the electric quadrupole response, again, hidden in this map is, there's this, the response depends on the gradient of the electric field, okay? Not on the actual electric field. And this is very important. Photo detectors, conventional photo detectors, just measure the actual field at that local point and produce current and then integrate the total current. Here, that part is zero by dipole. That's why I said electric dipole approximation. So this is non-zero. So everything we measure is coming from the gradient of the electric field. Gradient, by definition, is a non-local phenomena. It's not local, right? There's a slope, okay? So now, hopefully, it will make sense where I'm going because, you know, the orbital angular momentum mode of light has gradients of field and phase, okay? So we need to measure the phase. So now this detector that we have, or this material we have, is sensitive to the gradient of this electric field, and that's important, okay? So, you know, so we have to develop a new response function theory because, you know, it's very complicated. Uh, typically, we work in momentum space, but light has to be homogeneous. Now we have, you know, now light is inhomogeneous in real space. So there's this mixed, you know, momentum, this beginner space, of R and space, uh, space and momentum. So this Zoran, a student of mine, worked with Charlie and Jean and Andrew Rapp and developed this response function, okay? So, uh, again, this is, uh, you know, these response functions are fundamentally different from if the light was homogeneous. Again, I won't get into this. But when you look at the response function, so when you have help from theory, it allows you to really probe and understand what you're doing. So what we realized, again, from symmetry requirements, was that these materials, this system was producing response only if the scattering, you know, electrons scatter, if, if you excite electrons, they scatter because of vibrations or impurities or whatever that is. That the response is non-zero non only if the scattering is asymmetric, which means if the scattering takes place from one momentum value to another, the reverse process has a different value. Okay, so it's asymmetric scattering. Very few techniques that I know of are sensitive to this asymmetric scattering. So whatever we measure, we can extract that, and I'll show we extract that. Okay, uh, what we also showed again, those are details. As I said, the Berry curvature is very large where the, where the wild cones meet, and actually goes to infinity. So we showed that what we have is a very pro, very strong probe, very sensitive probe of Berry curvature. And importantly, uh, we also showed that the, our measurements are sensitive to the band inversion. Band inversion is a hallmark of topological systems. So same technique, you know, I'm a spectroscopist at heart. So if we have, if we can develop techniques which can probe all these things, it's just very gratifying, okay? So from, you know, uh, from this, uh, where we get this zero, where we basically get this, uh, you know, signal inversion, again, you know, um, if we jump the details, we were able to estimate the asymmetric carrier scattering time. So we can also get the dynamics of the system from the same experiment. Of course, you have to do a spectroscopy, and uh, these are difficult experiments, but nevertheless, so these are the things that we can do, okay? Now coming back to the problem that I posed. So when we were producing these, these signals, you know, way back in, uh, whenever it was, 20, you know, the paper was published in 19, maybe 17 or so, I just got excited because, you know, I, I'd been thinking about this orbital angular momentum and detecting these OM modes on a chip for many years. Of course, but I had no answer, you know. So, you know, many things that bother you, you just you know, throw it at the back of your mind, you forget. But the moment we started seeing this signal, which is coming from the gradient of the field, that just got me excited, okay? Because now what happens in orbital angular momentum mode of light, if light carries definite orbital angular momentum mode, that information is, is, is in the phase. So light, as I said, the phase of light circulates like this, right? So in this direction, there's a phase gradient, electric field gradient coming from the phase, change of phase, okay? And that, if you Fourier transform, produces, you know, optical wave vectors uh, in that direction. And if you basically take the response, that produces radial photocurrent. So by designing these very unique electrodes, what Zurun showed very nicely, that indeed we can measure, read, read out the phase of this light reliably, okay? And this is, you know, and when we change this uh, quantum number of this orbital angular momentum mode of light, let's say M equals one, two, three, four, the current basically jumps in this discretized manner. And if you change from plus to minus, like when the winding changes, then the direction of the current also changes. So that's how sensitive they are, these detectors. And this happens only because we spend so much time trying to understand these materials, developing new probes, doing all the dirty work, you know, instead of writing 20 papers, you know, per year. <laughs> Okay, so this, since these detectors are sensitive to both optical polarization, a spin of photon, and orbital angular momentum modes, we can create these coupled states which are represented on what is called the Poincare sphere, okay? 
So you can see how complex these profiles are. You know, these are different phase profiles or different polarization profiles, sometimes going you know, radial, sometimes going like this, sometimes going in these, in these azimuthal circles. But what we showed, these topological detectors that we have can really map out all these states in a very systematic manner. Something that, you know, I've talked about this many years back and people made fun of me, so, you know, yeah, now we're back. So, yeah. so we can, so basically what we have is a topological material which detects the topological state of light, complete topological state of light. I mean, this is impossible, you even need a room full of this stage, you know, not room, I mean, this optics full you know, on this stage to be able to do this experiment. And to be able to do this on a chip is just incredible, in my opinion. And now you can do all kinds of things, communication, quantum communication, and so, so on. So now, as an engineer, as a scientist, and as a scientist, I have to, you know, we have to think. You know, this is a nonlinear experiment, nonlinear optical experiment. How do I increase the nonlinearity in my response? Because if I want to make detectors which are also sensitive, you know, I don't want to sh you know, shine 20 watts of power and then measure this, right? You want this to be measured over a single photon a few photons. How do I do this? So one way we are exploring is what I call these Moire lattices. So you take a two-dimensional material and then you stack another sheet of two-dimensional materials but at an angle, okay? So if the angle is small, then there's a new modulation that is created in the lattice which now becomes comparable to your optical wavelength, okay? So your optical wavelength is a few hundred nanometers. So if this lattice modulation is of the order of few tens of nanometers, again, as I said, now now this lattice can sense the gradient of these fields because the field is not constant, okay? So we can engineer this. So, so we have you know, uh, uh, the sample maker, Song Jin at uh, Wisconsin, who's, who grows these three dimensional stacks where the angle between two, two layers is very finely controlled, okay? So we can get this, what is called Moire of Moire, and, you know, and basically it, uh, transfer, uh, it basically produces what is called the flat band. You know? uh, this is the hallmark of uh, some of the Moire uh, uh, lattices, but again, not the most important. So the question, you know, so then we did the experiment and again found chiral response. Left and right circularly polarized light produced different, different current, Di the current direction change, plus to minus. And this, does, this is not obvious, just because your structural stacking, which has handedness, does not really mean your response becomes chiral. So the reason, and, and I want you to think, you know, you have an, uh, imagine yourself to be an electron and then you have, as it, it is going through the sheets, the angle is changing. So it is seeing an environment, a world that is twisting slowly. Okay? So it is breaking symmetries and it is producing, again, a very strong pseudo-magnetic field. Okay? And, uh, and this, this theory has been worked out by, uh, by, uh, uh, by Sarma at uh, Maryland. And this magnetic, pseudo-magnetic field basically nudges the electron depending on the handedness of the structure, either one direction or the other direction. Okay? And the response is incredibly strong and so strong that now, and this is the theory that Zurun worked out with Gene. I mean, it's an incredible theory. Of course, you know, I don't want you to pay attention to this, but hidden here is this term, which I find absolutely incredible, because what this term is showing is very, very interesting correlations between K is the momentum of the electron and Q is the momentum of the photon. So if you have a flat band, then different regions of the flat band get very strongly correlated via this term, and this shows up in a photocurrent response. And since this shows up in a photocurrent response, we have these very interesting new band geometric terms, okay, which, which corresponds to terms corresponding to Q, Q is the momentum of photon. And the fact that we can measure Q, Q square and Q, Q, which means in any material, this response will be practically zero because they scale as one by omega. You know, omega is 10 power six or 10 power eight hertz or 10 power 10 hertz. So you can imagine how Q square and Q, Q terms will be. But because we have this Moire lattice, these terms can be measured. We have a theory uh, where we can extract some geometrical you know, values or attributes of this quantum geometry of these very interesting structures, and more importantly, you know, design all these very interesting detectors and other optical devices. So I'm going to, how much time, do you have a few minutes? Minus two, okay, so I'll, <laughs> I'll extrapolate to plus two, okay? So again, in just, you know, just two minutes, you know, you know, rather than rushing, I just decided to spend time in the first part is our, our efforts you know, towards creating these waveguides and routers, which are also topological. Uh, again, the idea is you know, from these elect topological electronic systems, uh, you know, what, what, what was learned was that this basically is a, is a general property of waves, of periodic waves. If your system has periodicity, you can endow topologies in different, you know, in acoustics, in, in, in optics, okay, as long as you have a periodicity. So, you know, so 
So what we found was, and again based on some papers, if we create a photonic crystal of hexagons, and what we do is keeping the, the hexagon the same, the size of the hexagon the same, but these dark circles that you see, these are resonators in which light is confined. We just expand the resonators or bring it close, okay? But this outline, this hexagon is the same. We either bring them close or take it apart. Then we can basically get uh, this, you know, when, when, when the hexagons are close or when they're apart, far apart, and this is when the hexagons are, this is like a regular benzene, so that's why the bands cross, so it's a semi-metal in the electronic sense. Uh, these, when, when, when it is contracted, hexagons are contracted or expanded, these two band structures look very similar. You cannot distinguish, but they were found to have different topologies, okay? And if you stitch them together, okay, if you create an interface of this topology and with the other, then as I said, the, the, surf, the, the, the interface, there's a very strong mode at the interface. This is, and this is nothing but what I'm describing is nothing but the optical analog of the quantum spin hall effect, but for photons, okay? So these are the, these are the states. And interesting thing here is, so we can measure this, we are one of the first ones to measure. So this is real space. If we shine right circle polarized light on this interface, then light goes in one direction. And because these are topologically protected, it can undergo, it can basically navigate these sharp corners without scattering, without scattering too much, okay? And I just changed the polarization of light, that's it. Shine at the same spot, and now it propagates exactly in the opposite direction, okay? So these are photons. Photons are very interesting, you know, all the communication all works with that. But they have one fundamental problem. They don't interact with each other. They don't interact with fields. So there, you cannot have any nonlinear devices with photons. So nonlinearity has to come from a material. That's, you know, that's the key, okay? So any materials, ex material excitation, like excitons or anything, like vibrations, you can manipulate with fields. They can scatter with each other. And when you make them very strong, when the coupling between the material and the photon is very strong, then we can create what are called polaritons, which means the excitation in the system is neither light nor matter. It's a admi coherent admixture of both. So you use the properties of photons that they are coherent, they can move over long distances, and the nonlinearity of matter to create these polaritons, okay? So, so, this, so the topological, first topological polariton was the optical, was the quantum Hall analog. They applied magnetic field. But, and then they showed this, uh, you know, the quantum Hall of uh, effect of light, uh, but here of polaritons, but here the experiment was done at four Kelvin and a huge magnet, five Tesla magnet, magnetic field was needed. You know, you cannot have, you know, a portable computing device with these constraints. So again, so I'll, I'll very quickly go through this. So in short, we've done this. So what we took was, we took this quantum, this, this photonic crystal that I mentioned which was a topological photonic crystal, then we coupled this to a two-dimensional material, created polaritons, okay? And then we had to be very, you know, we had to do some very, very interesting things for that to happen. And indeed, we were able to make a quantum spin hall analog of, you know, of, 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 polar, of, of polaritonic analog of quantum spin hall. So when we, you know, so when we shine, this, what you see here, here is a polariton that is propagating, right circular polarized light kicks the polariton in one direction, left circular polarized light kicks in the other direction, okay? And it can navigate a sharp turn, and this is incredible. It's a very sharp turn, which, you know, which, which we've shown, which we're showing that the polariton can navigate without really backscattering and, 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 you know, and not being able to navigate. So these are the, some of the protections that we get from the design of these structures. So, okay, and you, know, you can apply fields and manipulate them. So I'm, I want to summarize with this slide where I started from. So again, where do we stand? This is where we stand, you know? This is some of the work that Liang Feng, who's in the audience, my colleague uh, and good friend, uh, he, he's been uh, leading, where you can create very interesting states of light on a chip, all spin or orbit coupled uh, you know, states of light. And what we, we made these uh, waveguides that are sensitive to the polarization and other attributes, and detectors that are sensitive to both polarization and orbital angular momentum mode. And now, you know, we're trying to push this to the quantum limit. So in essence, what, I, what I've been discussing is, our efforts, you know, first at the very fundamental level, trying to understand like matter interactions, or in a sense, what, what matter is, how, to, how it behaves, what are the properties. And then from those principles, we engineer new devices, new, new architectures, and then we you know, try to come up with, uh, with new devices. And, and, the, and, the, and apparently we're pushing this into the quantum regime. So with this, I end I, uh, my talk. I thank all my colleagues, my students, my family, everyone, you, uh, for this. Uh, uh, you know, for this incredible journey that we've been able to afford as of now. So thank you very much, and I look forward to your question. That was a tour de force. <laughs> Questions from the audience?
Yeah, I mean, you have this modulation of this, uh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, so like, like, like you see in charge density waves, it's not a charge density wave, yeah. Sorry? Depending on the angle. So if you have a bilayer moiré, then, the, then it is really sensitive to the angle. You have to be within a degree or you know, less than a degree. But if it, what we have is a moiré of moiré, right? You have a central layer, and then let's say you have only nearest neighbor interaction. So this makes it more robust, and also the difference of the two angles can create very really large length scale modulation, which, com which is comparable to the optical length scale, like you know, ten tens of nanometers. So that, that's the advantage here. So if, if the topological phase, you know, these topological phases are defined by symmetry. If, you bre if the perturbation breaks that symmetry, then, then you lose all the advantage of this topological protection. Just like in the quantum spin hall effect, if you apply magnetic field or if there's magnetic impurities that breaks time reversal symmetry, then, then those states will gap out, and then you will not have that. But the creation that a sphere It depends how much, right? I mean, so, you know, like you know, what Liang does and what other people and, you know, if you remove some resonator, if you create a defect, if it's not a very strong perturbation and still preserves the symmetry, then the light can navigate around that defect. So it, it will try its best to navigate around those localized perturbations, yes. But of course, you know, there's a limit. If you apply too much strength and then destroy the structure or, you know, get a new symmetry, or then it's not going to work. Thank you. So Thank you. on behalf of the school, it's my great pleasure and honor to present to you this plaque which says, George H. Hallmeyer, Faculty Award for Excellence in Research, presented to Ritesh Agarwal for groundbreaking contribution to materials for applications in integrated photonics and electronics, October 4th, 2022. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's also my pleasure to share another great piece of news. Um, Ritesh has been recently named the, the Srinivas Ramanujam uh, Distinguished Scholar in the School of Engineering and Applied Science. Ritesh spoke of two branches of mathematics, number theory mm -hmm. and topology. He talked about topology quite a bit, but not number, number theory, theory yes. which is what Srinivasan and Ramanujan named. Yeah. So this is an an anonymous donor who chose to name the award after uh, one of the greatest number theorists. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank again. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. We have a reception uh, outside for, for Ritesh. Please join us. <laughs>